right, welcome to CPFD's Getting Started with Virtual Reactor 22.1 webinar. We're excited to have the opportunity to tell you about the 22.1 release and show you a number of new features and enhancements. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. If you miss anything or want to share something you saw with a colleague or friend, uh, you will be able to do that. The recording will be posted up on our website's webinars and presentations page under the resources tab. And this webinar should be posted there in the next 48 hours or so. So make sure you check back then to view the recording. Uh, we would like this webinar to be interactive um, and we need your help to make that happen. As you think of questions, please put them in your question panel. We have intentionally allocated a significant amount of time to address your questions after the presentation, and it will really help us to stay organized if you put in the questions as they come up instead of all at the end. And for those of you joining us today who are new to CPFD software, um, let me briefly introduce our company. Here at CPFD Software, we are advancing multi-phase simulation and technology for fluid particle systems, primarily fluidized bed reactors. Our Barracuda Virtual Reactor software product models the 3D transient hydrodynamics, heat balance, and chemical reactions in industrial units. It is typically used to improve the reliability and performance of these systems through simulation. These are often industrial units that operate 24-7 for quite possibly years on end. For operating units, virtual reactor simulations allow you to look inside the system in a unique way, determining root causes of underperformance and use virtual testing to reduce the risk of making any changes. And often as you're looking at the software results, other ideas come to mind and additional optimization opportunities are identified. For those of you developing new technology, Veracuda is used to accelerate and broaden that R&D and then quickly commercialize, scale up, and communicate the unique capabilities of your technology to customers, partners, and others. So now let's get into the webinar itself. Our presenter today is Sam Clark. Sam is the Veracuda Virtual Reactor Product Manager and has been at CPFD since 2008. He has worked in a number of areas at CPFD over the years, uh, from software testing to engineering service projects to customer support and training. In his current role as the product manager, Sam works closely with the development team to design features and capabilities for virtual reactor that benefit our customers all over the world. Um, so now I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Thanks for the introduction, Rosemary. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's joining us for the webinar today. Uh, the development team here at CPFD is proud to release Barracuda version 22.1, which has a number of great new features. If you're a Barracuda user, you should have received our release email earlier this week. If you didn't, please let us know and we'll make sure that you're on our email list for release announcements in the future. Version 22.1 is available for download on the CPFD support site. So if you haven't gotten it yet, I encourage you to log into the support site to get it. Uh, you can find more details about all the things we'll cover today in the release guide chapter of the user manual, along with links to the full documentation sections in the manual. This year, one of our primary development goals has been to expand Barracuda Virtual Reactor's multi-phase simulation capabilities for vapor, liquid, solid, or BLS systems. And the 22.1 release is the culmination of many months of work by the CPFD dev team. Building on the liquid and vapor phase improvements from the 22.0 release that came out in May, this release adds the ability to simulate Lagrangian gas vapor bubbles in liquid domain systems. These bubbles are similar to the Lagrangian particles that you've always been able to simulate with Barracuda, but they are distinctly different in several ways. Uh, first, bubbles are composed of gas and or vapor materials, as opposed to solids, liquids, or volatiles that compose particles. Second, bubbles are only available in incompressible simulations with liquid flow domains. Additionally, there are a number of physics calculations that have been added specifically for bubbles. Uh, one aspect of the new physics implemented is that bubbles take into account surface tension and they are compressible 
they change size due to pressure fluctuations in the flow domain. Additionally, since bubbles are typically much less dense than the fluid domain, virtual mass force and lift force are important and have been added to virtual reactors capabilities. These forces are typically negligible for solid particles in gas domains, but for gas vapor bubbles in a liquid domain, their effects can become very significant. Uh, finally, the gas and vapor materials in bubbles can participate in mass transfer to and from the liquid domain. Gases are transported via a gas absorption model, uh, while vapors are transported through the evaporation model. This animation shows a small scale demonstration of bubbles flowing in a liquid column. Bubbles are introduced at the bottom of the domain and are lifted due to buoyancy. The motion of the bubbles can be visualized in a manner similar to, your, to what you're used to with particle visualization. Here we've colored the bubbles by speed and volume fraction, and we've used a slice in the rightmost frame to show the speed of the liquid domain. I'll show an industrial scale emulated bed example in a few minutes to demonstrate a few more things about bubbles. Uh, this release also includes a number of improvements related to tracers, which are Lagrangian entities with no mass or volume. Tracers follow the fluid flow and they can be used to visualize flow patterns and to quantify fluid resonance time. In past versions of Barracuda, uh, tracers could only be fed into the simulation using injection VCs. Uh, but in version 22.1, we've added the ability to feed tracers at flow BCs and pressure BCs as well. Uh, in addition to that, tracers are now recorded as they pass through flux planes. Uh, this is especially useful when you enable the option to output tracer data, which is analogous to raw particle data. Uh, when you use this feature, each tracer that crosses the flux plane will record information such as its unique ID, its residence time, species, and speed. Uh, the image on this slide shows tracers visualized in TechPlot and colored by residence time. The tracer data from the flux plane near the top of the system was analyzed to create the histogram shown. Uh, this allows us to quantify the fluid residence time in a very useful way. For example, um, in this case, it looks like most of the fluid travels from the bottom to the top of the system in about 40 seconds based on the peak of the histogram. Tracer information is also recorded in history.log and more visualization data variables have been added so that tracers can be colored by a number of different parameters in tech plot. Um, finally, GPU parallelization has been added so that simulations with tracers can run much faster than they did in previous versions. Uh, we hope that these improvements make tracers a more useful tool for many Barracuda users. A change you'll notice in the virtual reactor graphical user interface is that the dialogues for defining pressure, flow, and injection boundary conditions have been reworked to use a tab-based design. This change makes defining BCs a more consistent experience and provides more logical organization of settings contained in each tab. In the location tab, you'll find region selection and flow direction controls. In the flux plane tab, all the settings related to flux planes, such as name and output options are present. In the fluid tab, you can define the composition, flow rates, and other aspects of fluid flow at the BC. In the particles tab, you can control whether particles are allowed to enter or exit the system at the BC and specify flow rates and other properties. Um, in some dialogues, uh, you'll see that particles and bubbles are present together when you have an incompressible simulation. Um, so just be aware of that. These, these screenshots are from a compressible simulation, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, when I show you the GUI. Uh, finally, in the tracers tab, you'll find all the settings related to feeding tracers at the BC. Okay, uh, to demonstrate the new features in this release, we're going to look at the set of a simulation of a commercial scale ebulated bed residue hydrocracker. Ebulated beds are three-phase fluidized bed systems with a liquid flow domain, particles acting as catalyst, and gas bubbles flowing from the bottom to the top of the system. Residue hydrocrackers are used in refineries around the world to increase production of diesel fuel. Uh, the example simulation we'll be looking at today is 12 feet in diameter and 120 feet tall. 
and it has internally recycled liquid and bubbles from the top to the bottom of the reactor. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, this particular case, uh, this took about 52 hours of wall time to run with two NVIDIA 100 v, uh, V100 cards. Um, so these types of simulations can be completed in, in very um, short times with GPU acceleration. Uh, in this case, uh, multiple liquids are present in the domain and each has a corresponding vapor or gas counterpart and a fluidized bed of solid catalyst particles is used to promote the chemical reaction shown here, uh, which converts vacuum resid and hydrogen into naphtha, diesel, and other products. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and drop out of PowerPoint now so that we can take a look at the Barracuda GUI. And let's see, there we go. Maybe I'll drop out of PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, so here, um, starting up the version 22.1 GUI, um, I want to show a couple of things. We'll, we'll get to the emulated bed case, but one thing that I want to show first is that um, for people who've used Barracuda before, this is a little bit different than what you've seen in the past. So if we create a new project, first I want to show you uh, creating a compressible project. This is a new dialog that was added for 22.1. Uh, when you create a simulation uh, or when you create a project file, is going to ask you, do you want this simulation to be compressible with gases and vapors in the domain, or do you want it to be incompressible with liquids in the domain? And then you, then you can have bubbles also in, in an incompressible simulation. Um, so first, let's say we want to create a compressible project. What you'll see here is the project setup tree is essentially the same as it's always been before, right? You won't notice any changes in the labels or anything like that. Um, if you go to global settings, you will notice that there's a new um, item here that shows you what your selection was on the flow type. Um, and be aware, this selection cannot be changed once you create the project file, right? So make sure if you're simulating a gas domain, make sure you choose compressible. If you're simulating a liquid domain, make sure you choose incompressible. Okay, let me show an example of an incompressible project. Okay, so now we'll choose incompressible. Now this will enable um, a number of things related to bubbles throughout the GUI. So now you'll see particles and bubbles, particles and bubble species, particle and bubble ICs, right? So what we've tried to do is throughout the Barracuda GUI, make it really clear um, when you can use bubbles, uh, when you can only use particles, and there aren't too many situations like that, actually. Um, they're, they're pretty pretty universal throughout the GUI. Um, so here, if we go to global settings now, uh, we can see that we've chosen incompressible. Um, this informational text is still here, and now you have your liquid compressibility parameters. Um, be aware, these used to be in base materials, but we moved them, and so now they live here on uh, global settings. Okay, let's go ahead and open up the ebulated bed case. Okay. And in this case, I just want to demonstrate a few, um, a few things that have changed in the, in the product for people who've been using version 22.0. Um, a few things will be new in 22.1. Um, so first, let's look at base materials. Um, one thing you'll notice here is that for these types of VLS systems, you'll often have a number of different phases or materials of different phases in the system. Um, so in this case, we have solid catalyst. We have a number of liquid species for diesel, vacuum gas oil, vacuum residue, um, a few gas species. Um, so here, let me open the diesel species as an example here. Uh, this is a liquid vapor species so the vapor portion of it can be in the bubble phase um, and then the diesel component can go from the vapor phase to the liquid phase and vice versa because we have the evaporation model enabled right so this is what lets the mass transfer happen between the liquid and vapor phases for liquid vapor materials uh, if you look at a gas material for example um, this is slightly different. This uses a Henry's law constant rather than the evaporation model. Um, but nonetheless, gas materials in the bubbles 
can be absorbed into the liquid phase. And so uh, mass transfer occurs, bubble size changes, liquid composition changes, um, all those sorts of things from that mass transfer. Okay, um, let's look at the particle and bubbles definitions. So if we go into this uh, section of the GUI, uh, a lot of this is going to be exactly the same as it has been in past uh, versions of Barracuda. Um, the one new thing you'll notice is that for incompressible simulations, we have a new section that's called dense fluid forces. And so these are forces that usually do not matter for solid particles flowing in a gas domain, but they do become important for gas bubbles flowing in a liquid domain. And so there's two specific forces that have been added. One is called virtual mass force. The other is called lift force. Um, these are enabled by default for incompressible simulations and they're disabled by default for compressible simulations. Um, you have the ability to turn them on or off if you choose to do so, but um, just be aware that that's what those are. Uh, let's look at drag models real quick. Um, you'll notice one new drag model that we implemented specifically for bubble simulations. Um, so this is a Tomiyama drag model that was developed for, for bubbles, uh, gas bubbles flowing in liquid domains. And then there's a Rocair um, kind of modification for bubble swarms. And so uh, at the moment, this is the most appropriate built-in drag model for bubbles in these types of systems. So if you're, if you're starting out, then I would start with this one. Um, you can certainly make a copy of it and then you can get into like user defined variations and that's perfectly fine. Um, for example, Tomiyama has one version for pure distilled water and another version for water that has some contaminants. Um, so there, there definitely are variations out there that could be appropriate depending on what you're doing. Um, for the particle species in your system, uh, generally you would still go with one of these other drag models that you've always been using before, such as when you ergen or, or something like that for the particles. And so you can, you can certainly choose independent drag models for the particles versus the bubbles. Let's look at defining a species here. Um, when you create an incompressible simulation, you'll notice that the single add button that you had before now splits into two buttons. So you can either add a particle species or you can add a bubble species. So just be aware of that um, kind of two distinct modes there. If we look at this bubble species, you'll see the definition is, is very similar um, to what you would know from particles. If we go to applied materials, um, instead of solids or liquids or volatiles, now we get a list of vapors or gases. So the same concepts, but just different materials available. In this simulation, we're just um, injecting pure hydrogen bubbles at the bottom. Um, size distributions are very similar to particles as well. Um, so in this case, we've just defined the size range from 0.1 to two millimeters diameter, and this will give us a normal distribution. If you know something more detailed than that, you can always do a file for a bubble size distribution. I, I guess we need to create a new acronym, BSD. Um, but yeah, that's, that's available. Um, and then of course, drag model selections um, are still available as well. Okay, let's look at initial conditions. For this type of simulation, again, the, the initial condition definition is gonna be very similar, um, except for now you have the option to initialize a, a liquid species throughout the domain. Um, you'll notice that gases are also present here. If you initialize gases in the domain, what you will get is absorbed gases. So these will not be bubbles necessarily, but they will be gases that are absorbed at time equals zero into the liquid phase. Uh, if you look at particle and bubble ICs, um, in this case, we've just initialized a bed of catalyst particles. And so this is perfectly possible to do. You don't have to initialize bubbles at time zero, but you can if you would like to. Um, for this simulation, we initialize particles and then we start feeding bubbles through boundary condition um, when the simulation starts. Okay, let's look at boundary conditions. Uh, as we mentioned in the PowerPoint, 
Uh, one of the big user interface changes that you're going to see is with the pressure BC, flow BC, and injection BC editors. Um, in older versions, all of the settings were available on one page, and it was it was getting a little crazy once we started adding bubbles and tracers to all of the BC types. And so we transitioned to this to try to keep things a little bit more organized and, and collect related settings together. Um, so now as you work through this, you'll, you'll be able to define the location, then the flux plane, then the fluid properties and flow rates, uh, particle and bubble properties and flow rates, and tracer injection if you want it. Right, and, and tracers are totally optional in every boundary. It's not like you have to have them, um, but they could be very useful. And we'll, we'll show an example of that um, in a few minutes. Okay, and you'll notice that flow VCs and injection VCs look very similar to the pressure VC dialog. Um, one other thing to point out, and I'll show a little bit more about this once we get back to the PowerPoint as well. Um, Passive scalar VCs are being deprecated. And what this means is that you can still use passive scalar VCs in this version, which is 22.1, um, but we do plan to remove them for version 23. So what we're recommending is that um, if you have passive scalar VCs, um, in most cases, you should be able to uh, get information that's either equal to or more convenient and better than passive scalar VCs by using tracers. And so uh, we recommend that everyone uh, transition from this type of VC to using tracers for quantifying fluid resonance time. So you'll see that warning if you try to um, create a new passive scalar VC. Uh, let's look at chemistry real quick because this particular system does have chemical reactions. Uh, if we look at our rate coefficient, um, this is kind of a typical Arrhenius form rate coefficient and and with uh, these types of incompressible simulations you can use any of the um, forms that you're used to um, including user defined expressions so it should be quite flexible uh, this particular rate depends on fluid volume fraction and catalyst volume fraction and temperature uh, and then if we look at the reaction itself what we'll see is that uh, the vacuum resid in the liquid phase is going to react with hydrogen that is transferred from the bubble phase to the liquid phase through gas absorption. And after that reaction takes place, we'll be creating naphtha, diesel, vacuum gas oil, and propane. And so um, this is an example of liquid phase chemistry. Um, and, and we started supporting this in version 22.0. But now with, with the introduction of bubbles, I think this will become a lot more useful and more industrial uh, relevance for a lot of people um, now that you can do these types of reactions. Uh, if we look at data output, let's look at flux planes real quick. Um, one thing we showed earlier was that now all the flux planes have the option to output tracer data. And, and this is where I think it's going to be really useful for a lot of people to do quantification of fluid residence time because you get very detailed information about every tracer that passes a flux plane. Um, you can do some really nice filtering on, on uh, properties of the tracers. So uh, that should be pretty handy for a lot of people. And if we look at visualization data, uh, one thing you'll notice is that when you create an incompressible project, you'll see a lot more um, entries available here that are specifically related to bubbles. Um, if you create a compressible project with a gas phase domain, all the bubble entries are hidden because they don't apply to that type of simulation. Um, but for this type of liquid domain simulation, you have a lot of flexibility here to get information about uh, bubbles, both on the Eulerian side for the fluid phase, and then also the Lagrangian side for the, for the Lagrangian bubble entities. Um, so there's a lot of information available, visualization data, average data, data planes, data points. Um, we've, we've made sure to make this consistent through all of the output data types. One thing you'll notice with raw data is that um, the output options here are currently kind of combined. So if you want raw particle or bubble data, you check this box, you choose the options that you want, 
Um, and then when the output comes out, you'll notice that there are two separate sets of files. All of the raw particle data goes to raw dot particle and then a timestamp. Um, and all of the raw bubble data goes to raw dot bubble and then a timestamp. Um, so we decided to separate these just so people would have to do less filtering on like, is this a particle or is this a bubble? Um, so just be aware of that there is kind of a new set of output files associated with raw bubble data. Okay, let's look at run. Um, the run page is unchanged. And if you do a view setup, uh, what you'll see is that techlot will start up. And uh, here it's starting up on my computer. The little splash screen went to my other uh, screen here. Okay, there it is. The whole tech plot window went to my other screen. Okay, so if you if you look at a view setup view, um, this is going to be very similar to uh, past versions, right? Flow VCs are still red, pressure VCs are yellow, baffles are shown. So in this case, there is a distributor at the bottom that's implemented with the baffle. Um, we see BC connectors drawn as lines. Um, one new, uh, one change is that if you are injecting uh, tracers with injection VCs, you'll see just a sphere in the model. Um, and so when you inject tracers in this way, they don't have an initial directionality of their own. They're, they're just gonna follow the fluid flow. Um, but that's what this small sphere is showing us here is, is the location of that injection VC location. Okay, uh, if we go to post run, we're going to get rid of that. Um, again, the interface here is, is the same. It's unchanged from previous versions. Uh, if you open view results, my, my computer is thinking here. Okay, uh, the default view for view results is still the same as it was in past versions. Um, you'll see particles colored by a volume fraction. And uh, one thing you'll notice is in the quick macro panel, there are a number of new items here that are specifically related to bubbles or, or changes related to bubbles. Um, so there's one combined view, which is particles and bubbles by species. And so this, this could be a useful view if you wanna show all of your particles and all of your bubbles and see where they're located. Um, you can do that type of thing. Um, the other options will essentially turn off the particles um, on their zone, and they'll show you just the bubbles and bubble information, right? So be aware of that. Some of these are kind of duplicated between particles and bubbles because um, they are in distinct zones. And so this can become important when you start doing post-processing. If you look at your zones list, you'll see that cells are on their own zone, then bubbles, then particles, then tracers. Um, what this does is it gives you a good amount of flexibility, right? You can show any one of these in isolation, or you can show any combination of them together. So you should have a good amount of flexibility when you start post-processing uh, bubble simulations. Uh, one example of this is I made kind of a, a layout that was already set up so that not everyone has to look at me clicking through TechBlot for a long time. Um, this is just uh, multiple frames all in the same tech plot window. And just to illustrate, right, the left frame is fluid information using slices in tech plot to show fluid speed. The second frame is particles colored by volume fraction. So we can see the fluidized bed of the catalyst particles. Um, the third frame is bubbles showing the mass fraction of hydrogen within the bubble. And again, when you feed bubbles into a system, as we can see here, the bubbles are 100% hydrogen, but as they start flowing through the system, uh, some of the hydrogen goes from the bubble to the liquid phase. Some of the liquid phase components will go from liquid to the bubbles through gas absorption and evaporation. So your bubbles will definitely be able to change composition. They will be able to change size, um, all of those sorts of things as the simulation runs. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, the fourth frame is tracers colored by residence time. And so you can get some really nice information. This one is actually blanking any tracers that are older than 100 seconds and then uh, coloring the tracers by residence time 
from zero to 100. And so um, a lot of flexibility here. You can show a lot of good combined information about what's happening in these types of systems. Okay, let me jump back into the PowerPoint. See if it can remember where we were. Okay, um, so here, a few other changes uh, that we just wanna make sure people are aware of. Uh, one is that the batch movie script, which is included when you install Barracuda, has been updated in a number of ways. Uh, first, the speed of generating animations has been improved for a lot of cases, especially for simulations that are relatively small. Um, and this involves how the script is launching TechPlot and how it's interacting with it. Um, so hopefully you'll see a speed improvement there. Um, second, uh, we made some modifications so that the frame dimensions that you use when you're saving the style file are precisely maintained so that the exported animation is the same size as the original frame that you had in TechPlot. So um, hopefully that'll make the output sizes more predictable and consistent. Um, finally, we've added some logic to load in a file called bbr.setup.plt. Um, previously, this was not loaded in with Batch Movie, but now it is. And the advantage here is that it allows you to show things such as STL files, flux planes, um, any sort of geometry that's included in the setup view is now possible to use uh, when you're creating movies with Batch Movie. So hopefully that'll help people. Um, Okay, and then one, oh yeah, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, we wanna make sure that everyone's aware, passive scalers are going away. We're going to remove them in version 23. And uh, historically, this type of BC has been used for quantifying uh, fluid residence time by introducing a pulse signal of the passive scaler at a certain point in time, and then analyzing flux plate and data downstream to see when that passive scaler passes the flux plane. Um, however, this feature does have some serious limitations, and now we've added other features that can kind of do the job in a better way. Um, there's two specific ways that you can replace this functionality if, if you're using passive scalers. Um, one, you can now, uh, well, for the past 10 years, or whenever this happened, you can, you can use multiple fluid species in Barracuda, right? Um, when passive scalers were first put in, that was not the case. Uh, but now with, with different fluid species, you can still do like a pulse method where you, where you pulse in one fluid species and then you look for it at flux planes downstream. Um, the other approach is to use the new capabilities that we talked about for tracers. Um, by analyzing tracer data crossing the flux planes, it's possible to calculate fluid residence time in a lot of really nice and flexible ways. Um, so if you have any projects that are currently using passive scalar VCs, we recommend that you transition to one of these other methods. Um, and if you need any help making that transition, uh, please just contact our support team and we'll be happy to help you with that. Uh, in terms of simulation speed, um, users can expect speeds that are essentially equivalent to version 22.0. Um, this release, uh, we added a lot of physics capabilities and, and we made sure that all of these capabilities uh, were parallelized and they don't um, result in slower speeds by any means, right? So you should basically see similar scaling if you go to multiple GPUs. Uh, you should see very similar absolute speeds uh, if you were to compare version 22.0 to version 22.1, um, should be essentially the same. Uh, just as a reminder, if you are using multiple GPUs, um, our current recommendation based on our testing is that if your simulation has less than 10 million clouds, um, usually you'll get the best performance with two GPUs. Uh, if you start going higher than that, performance could actually degrade just because you don't have enough clouds. Um, if you have really high cloud counts, um, you could go up to, say, four GPUs. Um, and in some cases, we've even started to see uh, additional scaling beyond four, uh, but you have to have extremely large simulations to, to see that. Um, if you'd like to try out multi-GPU simulation capabilities, uh, you can always perform timing tests using test drive mode, which runs the solver uh, specifically for the purpose of recording speed information. Uh, keep in mind, if you wanna do that, you do need to have a Linux system 
with multiple GPUs installed that all meet the multi-GPU system requirements. Okay, I think those are all the things I wanted to talk about for this release. So I'll pass it back over to you, Rosemary. Okay, um, thanks, Sam. Uh, we will be getting to um, questions shortly. Um, so if you have a question, you can make sure to put it in the question panel now, um, if you have any. And then for those of you that are new to CPFD software, I just want to briefly let you know a few different ways that you can get started working together with us. So um, software licensing is the first method. It's where your team uses Barracuda directly um, to set up, run, and then post-process your simulations. We have a number of different licensing options available, so you can just contact our sales teams for specifics if you have any questions. Um, global teams can also take advantage of our global enterprise license option available in most countries. And virtual reactor licenses can be served either on-premise or on the cloud, which opens the door to using both your own hardware and cloud computing resources. And using the latest cloud computing hardware on Azure, um, we recently benchmarked speed ups of 1000x on an 8 GPU system. And so make sure you watch for publication of those numbers coming out soon. Um, if you'd like to add license tokens to your RLM server in order to run more simulations or take advantage of the speed of multi-GPU, you can just contact our sales team. It's really easy to add solver, chemistry, and or GPU tokens at any time to meet your needs. Um, we also offer engineering services for those of you with like a one-off or an urgent need, or if you'd like to gain the engineering benefits of modeling your system with Virtual Reactor prior to building out a team um, to run the software, and then contact us if you want to learn more about this option as well. And the easiest way to get started is with our training classes. And our next class is coming up in about a month, um, and more information on that in a few slides. Um, training can be combined with project work and licensing in what we call our Quick Start um, program, which is intended to get you up and running as quickly as possible. So we run the first models for you with our engineering services team, then we hand the models over to you, train you on the software, and then provide the software licensing. Um, this allows you to build out your own in-house capabilities with models that are already up and running. And lastly, we work with people in a variety of custom ways through various R&D partnerships, whether it is fluidization research, researching new models, technology development, and so forth. R&D partnerships can be direct with us or collaborative with our strategic partners. Um, so talk with us about your needs. Um, we have some upcoming events that we'd like to highlight real quick um, today. CPFD's Peter Blazer is presenting at Big Compute 22. His presentation is titled, Powering the Impossible, Addressing Our Planet's Toughest Sustainability Challenges. And it's going to be at 3.45 p.m. Um, Central Time. And you can still sign up to watch this presentation online. Um, so check out our website for more information with a link to that, signing up for Big Compute. Um, CPFD will also be attending um, the AICHE annual meeting next week in Phoenix. So if you're going to be there, we hope to see you there. And on November 17th, the Institution of Chemical Engineers will announce the winners of the iChemie 2022 Global Awards. Um, CPFD is honored that our joint entry with Encina Development Group is a finalist for two awards. Our collaborative entry is titled Converting Plastic Waste into Circular Chemicals and is the finalist for the Sustainability Award and the Process and Automation Digitalization Award. At the end of the month, we'll be presenting a joint webinar with Rescale, one of our cloud computing partners. Uh, Rescale makes running virtual reactor on the cloud as easy as possible. So if you're considering using cloud com compute resources for your simulations, we encourage you to attend that webinar as well. And finally, the fastest way to get started using Barracuda virtual reactor is to join a web-based training class that mixes videos, online tutorials, and uh, once-a-day virtual meetings with our support team engineers. And our next training is December 5th through 9th. So please email us at training at cpfd-software.com if you're interested in attending that training. And you can always check out our events calendar um, on our website for more details on these and any other upcoming events. And then if you have an upcoming event that you'd like us to put on our events calendar, just let us know. 
Okay, so I think now we're ready for questions. So if you still have questions, go ahead and put them in the question panel and we'll get to them um, right now or pretty soon. Okay, no. okay, yeah. So Sam and I, will, you will answer the questions. I'll ask the questions. Sure. Right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the first question that we have here is, to what extent do you think the bubble function in Barracuda can simulate real bubble column? Okay. Columns? Yeah. yeah. Um, so in this case, uh, a big part of our development effort and, and a lot of the time that went into developing this feature was related to validation. Um, so so um, I, I think this is going to do a very good job of simulating uh, realistic physics inside of bubble column systems. Uh, the animation that I showed earlier in this presentation with the small uh, square cross section uh, bubble column, that was from one of those validation cases and uh, overall a very good quantitative agreement. Um, and so I, I think this is gonna be a really nice feature uh, to allow people to realistically simulate these types of uh, VLS systems. Okay, and then our next question is, is there any updates for heat transfer coefficients? Oh, okay. I, I know we've talked to a number of customers about this on support uh, over the past few months. Um, currently in this release, there are no specific updates to the heat transfer coefficients. So you still have the same interface. You can adjust the coefficients to values. Uh, if you think there are different values that are better, you can certainly do that. Um, I know that one of the feature requests we have in our system is to uh, implement like a user defined expression sort of handling for heat transfer coefficients. So I hope that we can get that um, in the near future. Now, I, I don't know if that's gonna be in the very next release or, or further out than that, but we know that that is important um, to a number of people. So, so we can hopefully look out for that in the future. Okay, yeah, yeah, and that brings up a good point of like, if there's something that you would like added um, or that would be really important for you, just let us know here and support. Yeah, by all means, yeah. yeah. If there are specific things, yeah. uh, send us that feedback. Yeah. yeah. Okay, our next question is, what are the important effects of virtual mass and lift force for bubbles? Oh, this okay. is a new thing. Right, exactly, exactly. And if, if you're not familiar with uh, simulating these things, which, which we were not before the development of this feature, um, these might be kind of new ideas. Um, so one is that virtual mass accounts for the motion and the acceleration of fluid displaced by the bubbles when they move. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind for particles surrounded by a gas, this force is very, very small, right? Accelerating the small amount of gas and the small mass of gas that's displaced by particles basically doesn't matter. Um, but for gas bubbles that are displacing a liquid domain, then it starts to matter a lot. Um, the, the actual difference between the two cases is actually about a million times of that force um, between the gas phase and the liquid phase uh, compared to just gas solid systems. Um, the liquid force, or the lift force, I'm sorry, accounts for the tangential or slip velocity gradients um, that have a much stronger effect on bubbles again, than they would on particles in gas domains. So this is when the, the liquid is uh, flowing past the bubbles. There is this tangential force that can cause bubble motion. And so um, by including these two forces, um, this, is, this is one of the reasons why I had confidence on that other question about um, how well do we think we're gonna be able to simulate real bubble columns um, because we've implemented this extra physics. I, I think we're in pretty good shape here. Okay. All right. Our next question is, um, is a different license required to use bubbles? Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's not, right? So if, if you have a base Barracuda license, um, then you can uh, create a compressible simulation. You can uh, add bubbles to the simulation. So there's, there's no uh, different licensing uh, requirement for that. Okay. Um, next question, is it possible to account for bubbles of rising velocity and bubble size distribution in this release? Yeah, definitely. So uh, when you create your bubble species, 
uh, you can do a size distribution just like you can do for particles. Uh, you can do a full file with, with different sizes, or you can do a normal distribution like we showed here. Um, and then, yeah, as the bubbles are rising, uh, there, there is data associated with these bubbles. So you can uh, precisely visualize its velocity, its size, all those sorts of things. And as I mentioned, bubbles do change size from compressibility and also from gas absorption and evaporation from that mass transfer um, based on the surface tension uh, relationships. Okay. I think that's all the questions that I see. Okay, um, yeah. So. All right, no more questions at this time. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email us and we can answer those. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you all for attending this webinar. Yeah. Yep, thank you.